Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the first session of the Battle of Ideas. Uh, this is Is White Privilege Real? It's the first session in a series of debates today on identity politics. White privilege is talked about a lot these days. You will have celebrities denouncing their own white privilege, denouncing the white privilege of others. Politicians are getting in on the act. White privilege is said to confer something even more than not just you know, the avoidance of outright racism, but maybe it confers other you know, more subtle, more uh, social benefits as well. So I'm really keen to get stuck into this um, quite juicy uh, debate. You know, do we even, do we even know if it's real? That's an exciting thing. What does whiteness mean? Um, who knows what that, you know, we, it, that'll all, that's all gonna come out. Um, I'm Fraser Myers, I'm a, a writer at Spiked. I also produce and host the Spike podcast, and we have a fantastic panel um, who are going to be debating all these issues. First off, we're going to have um, Catherine Burble Singh. She is the headmistress of the uh, controversial uh, Michaela Free School, uh, community school, the Michaela Community School, which is a free school. Uh, then we have um, Akhil Ahmed, who is the former head of religion at the BBC and Channel 4. He, is also, um, he also works for Ofcom and the Advertising Standards Authority and is a professor of media um, at the University of... I forgot the... Oh. <laughs> Which one's Bolton, Bolton. At the University of Bolton. Um, after that, we'll have Marion Francoise, who is a broadcaster, writer. Um, she's made documentaries about all kinds of things, from um, the refugee crisis to... Um, to the Muslim Pound um, for the BBC, for, uh, she's been a Europe correspondent for TRT. Um, most pertinently to this debate, she is the founder of We Need to Talk About Whiteness.com. After that, we have Courtney Hamilton, who is a photographer. He's worked with the Rankin Studio for Dazed and Confused. He's a writer, um, he's done a lot for Spiked Online, and he has been an uh, experienced anti racist campaigner in the past. So, um, this is the fantastic panel. I'm going to let them speak for about five to seven minutes each, and then we're going to go straight out to you, the audience. And please, this is the Battle of Ideas, so if you've not been before, it really is about your participation. Don't be shy. Don't feel as if you have to um, insert a point into a question in a really mealy-mouthed way. Just say what you think. Um, this is not a safe space, even though this is a, you know, difficult topic, um, please do not be afraid to say what you really think, what's on your mind, and then we're going to have a really interesting discussion. Okay, so let's kick off with uh, Catherine. Thanks. Thanks, Fraser. Is white privilege real? The simple answer I'd say is yes. Uh, I've, always, I've already made an, a pact with God that in the next life I get to come back as a white man, because to hell with this business of being a black woman, I tell you. Um, but I have to be rich, or at least middle class, and I have to be good looking. Uh, I'm thinking a kind of George Clooney look-alike, and certainly I can't struggle with my weight. And tall, I mean, I'm not coming back as a short white man. I mean, what would be the point of that? <laughs> of course, in the 1950s, pretty much anywhere in the Western world, if you had the choice of being a black man or a short, unattractive, overweight, poor white guy, there was no question. You'd have taken the white guy option every time. Nowadays, however, the choice isn't so obvious. And that's because skin color isn't the only thing that matters in life. There is pretty privilege, tall privilege, slim privilege. A Cornell University study shows that ugly men are 22% more likely to go to prison than the pretty ones. They also end up with sentences that are 22 months longer on average. Studies show that being the first born in your family is a massive privilege. Between brothers and sisters, the first born will outdo the second child, and the second will outdo the third, and so on. And an only child will outdo them all. The statistics show that if you come from a two-parent family where the parents work, you are more likely to make a success of your life. So that's another privilege. You were lucky enough that your parents didn't divorce and they got married before having you. There is also such a thing as black privilege. If you want to make it as a footballer or a rapper, you are at a huge advantage if you're black. The football touts are known for seeking out fast black boys. There is even nationality privilege. If you want to be a marathon runner, you better hope you're a Kenyan, because 68 out of the 100 top marathon runners in the world are Kenyan. So what does white privilege mean exactly? I've seen it in action, especially with white middle-aged men. They walk into some member's bar, they aren't on the list, or something's gone wrong. But the respect and treatment they receive is markedly different to how a black man would be treated in a similar situation. The other day, one of my kitchen staff at school disagreed with a decision of mine on how to run the school. And he said to me, no, honey, let me tell you how it works. Now, I couldn't quite believe what I was hearing, but could I get angry? No, 
I'd be seen as an overly sensitive female. I'm also a member of a charity board. I was once asked to sit on an interview panel, not because of my skills, but because I ticked the diversity box. That's what was said to me. You tick the diversity box. The white man who said this to me simply couldn't see who I am as a person and what I had to offer. My skin color and gender were all he could see. Those are just a few of the stories I could tell you about my life. It isn't that I don't experience this stuff. I'm just aware that the white boy growing up in Hull, whose parents can't read, is far less privileged than I am. It would be madness to suggest otherwise. And what do the statistics say of white privilege? 2015 report by the Institute for Fiscal Studies found that white British pupils in the lowest socioeconomic quintile are 10% less likely to participate in higher education from any other, than any other ethnic group in that quintile. When it comes to income, whites are also lagging behind some other ethnic groups. In the UK, 42% of Indian households have a weekly income of £1,000 or more, compared to 26% of white British households. Just talking about white privilege is crude and inaccurate. Yet talk of white privilege by the white metropolitan elite dominates our ways of life. Unconscious bias training is the trend in so many workplaces, especially in the US, where employees are told that white people have privileges no other ethnic group enjoys, sometimes at enormous expense to the taxpayer. For instance, the school's chancellor of New York recently introduced mandatory anti-bias and equity training for the city's 75,000 teachers at a cost of $23 million a year. As part of this training, top officials in New York's Department of Education were taught that the characteristics of white supremacy include perfectionism, worship of the written word, individualism, and objectivity. Indeed, the founder and CEO of Ascend Char Charter Schools in Brooklyn, Steve Wilson, was recently fired from his job for questioning this type of thing and for believing in objectivity. It was considered white supremacist rhetoric. If our teachers are being taught and pressurized to spe spread this nonsense about victimhood, telling certain races that they are oppressed and that the establishment is out to get them, then what hope do black kids have? That's the irony, of course. The main characteristic of white privilege is that you don't constantly get told that you are a victim. And what a privilege that is. No teacher is ever making excuses for you. No teacher is going to omit Shakespeare for you in favor of Benjamin Zephaniah because being black, you will identify more with Benj Benjamin Zephaniah over Shakespeare. No one is going to substitute Mozart for Stormzy for you. You are white, and so of course you can appreciate Mozart. Black kids can't learn French verb tables. I mean, everybody knows black kids can't learn verb tables. They need to listen to French rap instead. So yes, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> it's the truth. All we are is just a cut uh, up and we're not. Okay, okay, okay. We'll come to you, we'll okay. come to you later. So yes. <laughs> Put your hand up first, I'm coming to you first. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, there is, a, there, there is such a thing as white privilege, just as there is rich privilege and tall privilege and firstborn privilege. But harping on about these things is not useful. In fact, I'd argue that it is positively harmful. The most important privilege that exists, of course, is one's school. Go to a good school, and your chances for a good life are multiplied tenfold. Instead of spending our time discussing white privilege, we should be figuring out how to give all kids, whatever their color, an education to help them change their stars. Thank you, Catherine. I kill. Um, yeah, when I, when, I was, uh, when I was writing something down, I decided to not write something down because I knew there'd be no point because I, I looked at the panel and I thought, we're all going to be saying similar things probably or, or quoting some similar stuff because in the end, when, when we ask a simple question, what is white privilege? Well, we kind of like know what privilege is and I think you've, Catherine's just said it quite well, which is there are certain, there are lots and lots of different kind of privileges. So what I wanted to do was actually talk about just some of the kind of instances why people think or what they think around the subject matter. So, for instance, I was on a train a few weeks ago and there was a whole bunch of kids from, it was Coventry to London, and they were talking and they were talking around me. I might, they thought I had my headphones on. I was, I wasn't, at one point I wasn't listening because they were more interesting. And these were quite, you know, they were, they were just, they just finished their A-levels and they were going off to university and they were talking about the fact that, you know, you're, you wouldn't get into that university simply because you're white. And uh, what's going to happen? A white man can't get into this or a white man can't do that. And then when I think of some of the rubbish that was thrown at me when I got my last job at the, BB, at the BBC, um, in all the newspapers, you know, does it, why, doesn't the, why doesn't the BBC realize that we're still a Christian country? Or was one of the headlines, or, and I could go on. Some of the most snappiest one was why Akhil Ahmed shouldn't run the religion and ethics department at the BBC. 
But most of the stuff that people were writing about was the fact that they just presumed that this chap cannot in any way have got his job without being part of some uh, uh, positive discrimination kind of process. And that's what really hurt the most, actually. I wasn't bothered about some of the other stuff, like turning up at my dad's house, journalists turning up at my dad's house, you know, why turn up at some eight-year-old bloke's house to ask him questions, or journalists being thrown out of my university, my old university campus, simply because they were asking questions about did he have a girlfriend and what was he like when he was at university, and even my old professor finally realised this might not be a positive article. But the thing that really hurt was when they kind of like suggested that he only got this job because of who he is. So some of the things that were actually put in print were he only got this job because he was a Muslim or he only got this job because he was an ethnic minority or a white person can't do this job anymore. And they, people actually said that in newspapers. And so that's the kind of thing that I want to remind people of is to say when we talk about privilege, is it's often I even feel a bit weird about talking about white privilege because a little bit of me thinks about aren't we having, this is an identity argument that that ties us all to a particular time period, and I don't want to be in that time period anymore, etc. But the fact of the matter is, reality is all around us. And we just had a taste of it a few weeks ago with Naga Manchetti. So Naga Manchetti, uh, uh, a Dan Walker, who's a lovely chap, but Dan Walker asks Naga Manchetti questions about Donald Trump and what he said about the, the squad and how they should go back home if they don't like it here. And then Naga answers a question. And if you watch the actual clips, you'll see that she's really uncomfortable. And Dan, is, in a lovely way, is goading her to carry on the conversation. And eventually, she closes it down. And then when the, when the complaint comes in, it, the complaint is against both of them. But eventually, only one person gets found guilty, even if it was overturned. And that's Naga Manchetti. Because there is that kind of privilege that he can say things, and that yet she can't. And then if you look at the likes of Andrew Neil or any of these kind of, or all of these people who say particular kind of things, it seems to be okay. But when somebody who is not one of them says those things, then it becomes an issue. So white privilege does exist, but we just don't want to talk about it because if those of us that don't want to talk about it, often at times, it's because we don't want to be labeled in a certain kind of way. But the reality is you can't ignore it. And so those kind of like examples that I wanted to give just illustrate that actually it's all around us. And it's not some kind of academic kind of subject. I, for many, I, 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 there's an academic called Robert Beckford who I worked with for many years at, at Channel 4 and at the BBC. And for the last, and he, he's actually quite angry with me at the moment because about 10 years ago he pitched me an idea on white privilege and I said, who's going to watch this? And actually it's an old argument. And the fact of the matter is it, he was ahead of, he, he, knew what, he, knew, he knew better than I did. And the fact is I had my kind of privilege, the privilege of being in a position of authority over him, to say, I don't think that works. Yeah, I don't think that's an idea that anybody will watch. Now, in this instance, that was a brown person telling another brown, a black person, whatever, that actually your idea is great, but I don't think we're going to make it. But how many times is that person of colour, that person who makes that decision? And that's the issue, that's <coughs> the issue about what white privilege really is. A, a little bit like the person in Hull who doesn't have that kind of ability to go on on a journey and to actually ch achieve something that... The fact of the matter is, the vast majority of people who make these decisions, whatever the decision is, actually is somebody from a particular, particular kind of background. And my experience of that in the jobs that I've done has been that often we're reliant on somebody who understands the subject, and when they don't understand the subject, then their privilege comes in, and their privilege can be quite spectacular. So, you know, we have phrases like white-splaining and all those kind of things now. And... What they all really mean is somebody not thinking that you can do your job simply because you're not one of them. And that one of them can mean anything. So if you have an Asian or an African-Caribbean person who went to Eton, then Oxford or Cambridge and all those kind of things, and they're in a job, to me, they're white privileged as well because they're part of the institutions that are created that actually run the world or run this country in particular and run many parts of the world around us. And if people are going to those institutions and then coming out at the other end exactly like the people around them, then they're white privilege. So white privilege isn't about, for me, that's what I want to finish on, it's not, it's not about colour of skin. It's about having the ability to influence what goes on around, around you and others and not understanding that you have that privilege. Because if you have that privilege, then I, I would say you probably aren't white privileged in many if you under If you know you've got it, it's the ones that don't know they've got that privilege, like those boys, those privately educated boys on the, on the train journey that I had 
who simply don't understand that they are the most privileged guys you'll ever meet. Yet their whole thing was, oh, you can't possibly go to that university because they'll never take a white middle-class boy again. Like the people who say, you know, you're only, people like me, you know, the white middle-class man can never get this job because it will always go to a woman or it will always go to an ethnic minority because everything's going that way and the statistics will tell you, wake up, my friend, you are still in privilege. That's the dangerous, or, or the reason why Nagel <coughs> Chetty can get called out and somebody else can't get called out because the system doesn't even realise that they are protecting one particular kind of individual over another or giving that, what, that one particular individual the ability to say more than anybody else can. That, to me, is white privilege. And that's what I wanted to do with this particular thing, is actually try and maybe fill in the gaps rather than repeat what will probably be said, which I will agree with completely, which is it's all around us. We all know it exists, yet it, it seems to continue to exist and will probably always exist until, and I will talk about this in another session later on, demographic change might make it virtually impossible for it to exist in, this current, in, the, in the current way that it exists today. So that's what I want to do. When we have the questions afterwards, hopefully I can chip in. But I just wanted to kind of like just talk about some actual examples rather than talk about the numbers because the numbers don't often give you the, a, a correct indication of what the reality is. Thank you, Phil. Um, is white privilege real? Um, it seems to me that the question itself is a really good indication of <coughs> white privilege, uh, if only because the whole conversation around privilege began out of uh, the experience of people of colour discussing their experience of racism and discrimination. So unless you believe that when people of colour tell you that they're being discriminated against and experiencing prejudice, that they're lying, uh, which would suggest that you perhaps are a participant in a form of white privilege, then I think it's probably worth taking the term seriously. Um, it seems to me that it's the flip side of an ongoing attempt to question whether racism is real. We find new ways to reformulate the question of is racism real at different points in history. And, and at this particular point in 2019, uh, it seems that the way that we do it is by asking whether white privilege, which is essentially the flip side of people of colour experiencing discrimination, is itself real. So let's, let's talk that through, although it seems to me that a really basic uh, amount of research would reveal the extent to which there are enduring and quite perform profound forms of inequality that exist in the UK today. So a recent survey by The Guardian found that 1,000 people from, uh, who were surveyed from eth minority ethnic backgrounds found they were consistently more likely to face negative everyday experiences than white people in comparison in the poll. So for example, they found that 43% of those from minority ethnic backgrounds found that they'd been overlooked for work promotion in a way that felt unfair in the last five years. That's more than twice the proportion of white people. The results show that ethnic minorities are three times as likely to have been thrown out of or denied entrance to a restaurant, bar or club in the last five years, and that more than two thirds believe that Britain has a problem with racism. That is people on the receiving end of racism, two thirds telling us there is a problem with racism. To me, the only legitimate thing to do at that stage is to listen and to hear and to take it on board and to take action. Anything other than that is a form of white privilege. Questioning the experience of people of color when they tell you that racism is happening is itself a form of white supremacy. It's saying that my position in the society, my perspective stands above theirs. And that is an enduring aspect of contemporary society, which really does have its roots in history. And we can, we can maybe hopefully touch on that at some point in this. But, as we've heard from the rest of the panel, there are, of course, loads of different forms of privilege, but I think it's important not to use other forms of privilege to discount the current form of privilege that we're talking about. <coughs> Let's for sure have a panel around pretty privilege or class privilege or whatever other forms of privilege, but here today, what we're here to talk about is race privilege. That's what this conversation is about. And let's not use other forms of privilege to try and discount accountability when it comes to discussing race privilege. That's what this conversation is about. Now, when we talk about race privilege, I feel like there's a lot of confusion around what it is that we're talking about. And that's partly because if I went around this room today and I said, 
Oh, hi, sir. Would you, would you be happy to tell us about what it's like to be black and British? That would be considered a fairly legit question. We would ask people that on panels on live television. We would say, oh, madam, um, as a British Asian woman working in the NHS, what do you think of X and Y? But very rarely do we say to white people, what's it like to be white and British? What's your experience of being a white man? And the reason we don't do that is because most white people do not believe that their racial identity holds any meaning at all, which of course only suggests that you're not listening to anyone around you that isn't a person of color. Because if you were, you would know that your racial identity as a white person does have meaning, it does have a history, and it does have implications for how you're perceived in this world. And any time you refuse to acknowledge that, you are essentially refusing to acknowledge your peers as equals, and that is a form of white privilege. And we do it all the time. Now, if we're still not sure, even though we're hearing it from people around us, if you just ask most people of colour what their experience of being, um, of living in this country is, then we can look at some of the statistics. Only 3% of Britain's most powerful and influential people are from BAME groups, despite almost 14% of the UK population being of a minority background. From a list of just over 1,000 of the UK's top political, financial, judicial, cultural, and security figures, only 36, that's 3.4%, were from ethnic minorities. Just seven, that's 0.7%, were BAME women. In some sectors, the police, military, Supreme Court, and security <coughs> services as well as top consultancies and law firms, a recent study found that there were no people who were excluded from whiteness, as I call it, in those companies. Today in Britain, Pakistani and, Beng and Bengali people are more than three times more likely than white British to live in the most deprived neighborhoods. Rates of prosecution and sentencing for black people are three times higher than for white people. Unemployment rates are significantly, significantly higher for ethnic minorities, from mental health to education, crime to housing, there are enduring inequalities. Either you believe those are essential in, the, in their origin, and that you believe that there is some sort of uh, essentialist reason why some people end up disadvantaged because of others, or you believe that some people are experiencing prejudice and discrimination, and some people are experiencing what we can call privilege. Those are the options on the table. Now, I consider that whiteness has created a social hierarchy that we inhabit as white people, as in people who are identified as belonging to the white racial category, whether we recognize it or not. And if we're not confronting that social hierarchy, we're essentially complicit in perpetuating it. There is no neutral position when there is injustice, and there are clear injustices at every level of this society. Now, being anti-racist isn't, as a lot of, in my experience, white people believe it to be a moral position. It's not about just saying, well, I'm an anti-racist, I've got friends from all over, that's fantastic, but what are you doing about the fact that there are inequalities all around you? And unless you're participating in shifting those inequalities, you're benefiting from that hierarchy and doing very little to confront it. Whiteness is basically about swimming along in this society with no snag. For those of you who are, uh, don't know much about the history of white racial identity, I would really recommend looking into some of the fantastic history books around this. The, the word white as a racial category was essentially invented at a particular point in contemporary history around the 17th century essentially to give you the short summary, as a way of dividing a rebellion of the working class, if you want to call it that at the time. There were indentured servants who were of a poor European and poor African backgrounds who were serving essentially elite white Europeans. So think of them as the 1%, um, and then there'll be no comparisons to the contemporary situation at all. Um, that working class group was then divided because at a certain point they got joined together and decided that they were going to confront the unfair working com uh, conditions that they were being subjected to. The 1% decided that the most effective way to divide that rebellion, Bacon's Rebellion, look it up, um, was to take the white people in that group, the white Europeans, that they really had very little, virtually nothing in common with, um, and create a category white, which allowed them to separate them from the Africans. In so doing, they created one class that would become hierarchically subject to uh, servantship or slavery, which would be the beginning of that process. And there, on the other side, you would create a class of servants who would be allowed to 
benefit from limited privileges. Now, of course, over time, you had to justify that. So what we did as European societies is we built a whole body of cultural justifications. We built pseudoscience. <coughs> we built pseudo-philosophy. We created a narrative of history. It, it's imbibed in our literature. It's imbibed in our art, all of it to justify the racial supremacy of white people. And we continue to drink that Kool-Aid today. I'm, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Courtney. Uh, right, I am follow up on what's been said here. Essentially, I would agree, is it real? Or, on that question alone, I suppose, you know, in, we're in Britain, we're, or in the Anglo-American world, um, uh, you kind of have to say, in one sense, yes, um, uh, white privilege is real, but only insofar as empirically, the great majority of the people in those societies just happen to be white. So it's going to kind of, you know, in one sense, you know, the most privileged sections of those societies will happen to be white. Um, but in another <coughs> sense, um, uh, probably in the way that uh, Miriam was um, explaining uh, more so uh, uh, than anything else, is that uh, white privilege, um, or as I like to um, call it, I don't know if it's probably the correct um, way of even uh, describing it, but white privilege um, is probably best known as a, more as a theory of trying to understand where we are um, in terms of race relations uh, at any given time. And I think um, that is probably where um, there is a, a lot of problems uh, with um, white privilege as a method, as a, a methodology, as an idea or a notion in order to, that we can try to get to grips to find out where we are exactly today in terms of race relations. I think there's a big problem there. Uh, in many ways, uh, Miriam was trying to use uh, white privilege theory in order to try and understand uh, what, was going, uh, what is actually happening um, today. And um, as Fraser pointed out, um, it's very, very popular. It's, it's very, very fashionable um, to talk about white privilege theory. We see it all the time. Um, it, you know, uh, more so now, uh, especially so in the last five years. You can't, you know, sort of open a copy of the Guardian without, you know, some sort of reference to it somewhere um, or another. As a theory and as a means, as a method of understanding, I've written down here basically it's a crock of poo, you know, which I, you know, I don't, maybe I shouldn't call it that, but I think, um, you know, in many ways that's probably um, a, a correct way. I think there are other better methods, method, uh, methods of understanding where we are today um, uh, in terms of race relations, because um, I think in many ways actually things have. Um, uh, improved um, in many ways in British society and, and in American society, much more so uh, than we're currently being um, told at the moment. Um, let me just talk about, um, has anyone heard of um, uh, an academic called Peggy um, McIntosh yeah. and her... Um, uh, Knapsack. Yeah, unpacking the invisible... Na as, uh, hands up, has, has anybody read this? Just to give a quick right, okay. Well, it, you know, it's it, it's portrayed as being this, you know, sort of great, you know, sort of anti-racist. In fact, much of what we hear about white privilege and the notion of white privilege actually comes from um, uh, this um, kind of document. And I used to be criticising it, and I, I to tell you the truth, I hadn't even read it. And people were going, you know, Courtney, you know, just read the thing, read the thing. <coughs> So I said, OK, I'll read it. And I said, I didn't really want to read it, but I thought I'd better read it. And I was expecting a great tome of work, a body of, like, you know, it's kind of something, some big doorstepper of a work. Um, and um, so I downloaded this PDF. It took, like, a millisecond, and seven pages come up. So I was like, wow. Um, so that struck me. That alarm bell started ringing. It's mainly um, a biographical account of um, her own personal kind of, um, uh, of the way she experienced um, uh, kind of uh, white privilege. Uh, so in many ways, I was kind of surprised that people have taken this article and document and you know, 
blown it up to what it is um, today. And when I did look at it last night, I think what really struck me was the fact that um, much of it hasn't stood the test of time. Uh, she wrote it in um, uh, the late 80s. And um, for her, kind of white privilege was, um, you know, uh, she could, um, the company she could keep, she can guarantee that she could, you know, sort of, uh, um, uh, she could always be with the same race of people. Um, uh, that, you know, she could easily uh, choose that if, if that was what she wanted to do. And I thought, well, you know, if I wanted to do that today, it's not that kind of difficult. But I think what really, really bothers me, um, if I can try and wrap this up now, um, about white privilege and the notion of it, is that the flip side, the real flip side of uh, white privilege theory is the notion, uh, which is um, really isn't said, of uh, the black disadvantage. That if you have a constant fixed white privilege, you must also have a constant fixed white privilege a black disadvantage, which actually means, really, that um, black people actually really um, uh, have no agency mm -hmm. in that sense. They really have, they can't achieve or succeed uh, in life on the, under their own steam. Um, it's impossible. You can't really have white privilege on the one hand and um, without black disadvantages. And that's why I think it's not very useful um, uh, for understanding race relations, but I think at worst, it, it actually insults uh, white people as well as insulting black people unwittingly. It, it does that unwittingly. Um, uh, so ultimately, I think it's a, it's a racialist theory that we should be very, 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 very critical of. Uh, and I think we should be brave enough uh, to think of you know, more reasons why, you know, uh, we should stop trying to re-racialise our debate because the colour of anybody's skin should not matter in the year 2019. Thank you, Courtney. <laughs> right, so we're going to go out to you, the audience. I, I, I guess first thing I want to say is thank you very much. This is a fantastic debate. Um, and what I'm saying, I'm saying for myself as a human being. So I get slightly peeved when I'm told that I'm a black man, part of the black community. No, I'm, a, I'm an individual. So what I'm going to say now as, is as an individual and where I am now, and I've got a right to change my mind if I want to in the future, because I'm a human being. That's OK. Um, for me, I find it quite sickening that I am told that I am somehow lower because the white person has a privilege over me, which I know to be total nonsense because of my own background, where I have come from, and what I have faced from, how do you put it now, sorry, people of colour. I can't use the word coloured anymore, or I can use the word nigger. I don't know how it works exactly. But the point, the point being is that I have been abused. I have been let down. I have been... Um, um, suffered by black people in the past just as much, here we go, just as much by white people and other races and also by females. So when I get told that somehow I've only been oppressed or seemingly oppressed by white people, it is tosh. And I'm sick and tired of being told this nonsense when I know it's not about um, races, colours or sexes, it's about individuals. And some will like me and some will not like me. And that's how it goes, because they're all individual. So please, just use some critical thinking and stop just making it so generalised and so easy when you know human beings and life is so much more complex. And I, I forgot your name, I do apologise. Catherine. Catherine. Sorry, Catherine, I do apologise. I love what you do. I love what you do in regard to schools. And I agree with you 100%. If I had it my way, here we go, here we go. Something really deep here. <laughs> Something really deep. I would make sure that every single child from the age of three went to the finest schools and taught them critical thinking. Not how to be a victim, not how not to understand statistics when it comes to ethnic minorities and not look at the full details. And, and ask a question like, what do you mean by ethnic minorities exactly? How was that done, that so-called um, survey exactly? Give me more details, you see? 
Let's get some real critical thinking going here and ask some real powerful questions. And also know who you are. This is really important. Know who you are as a human being because you are so much more than your flipping color, than your sex and what you do, which is why we need great school to understand you are not a victim. Things will happen to you in your life which are very, very bad, but that's life, unfortunately. But you can come through on that. But you are not a victim. And don't let people who for their own, I don't know, for their own reasons, try and make it sound so simple and that you're just oppressed because of the colour of your skin and you can't break out of it. You know, the subject matter is uh, privilege. I would have hoped we would look more at what was the legal impact. You know, we've had legislation since 1965, 1976, right through to 2010, <coughs> on and um, policies, uh, about 90% now of um, employees are covered by equal opportunities policies. Um, all of those are real things that have taken place over the last sort of 40 years. Uh, and why, are, I, I want to know why we're not assessing what the impact of those are, because those are um, actual uh, structural adjustments that um, the, the polity has made um, uh, uh, to address what we think, I guess, is the same problem of race discrimination. Uh, and what's the assessment? Does, do, are we, uh, 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 is it a pessimistic view that actually things are as bad or worse than they ever were, or is that this is um, uh, good but not enough? And, and if it's good but not enough, why, why you know, what is it that's recreating uh, discrimination in society um, uh, that, that these uh, policies haven't managed to shift the thing? So I think if you're going to talk about privilege, private law, um, mm -hmm. we need to know uh, what are the laws. I mean, if you were talking perhaps about immigration law, I could see very clearly you could uh, identify discrimination. It's inbuilt, isn't it? If you discriminate in favor of the citizens against the people outside, that it's going to have a bias towards the people of the country. Uh, but in employment law or in um, uh, other kinds of law, um, uh, do, do we really see actual laws designed to put people uh, down on the basis of their race? Um, I just want to say that uh, I find the concept of uh, white privilege deeply, deeply racist. Um, it singles out an entire group of people on the basis of skin color. How spurious is that? And labels a, a, a blanket uh, accusation of privilege against them. Uh, it's an accusation that you can't defend yourself against because it's, it's an unconscious thing. It's not something, there's no evidence for it that can be, be brought, to, brought to light. And I think it's a th actually, it's a thought crime that is actually a deeply, deeply dangerous concept. First of all, Miriam, I take massive issue with your redefinition of white supremacy when you turn it from being an ideology that bad people believe into a systemic idea then you get to call people like me, who ask questions, a white supremacist, and I think that's disgusting. So I'm going to move on to the next point now, um, which is it, the, these ideas for, of white privilege, Courtney's already covered, it comes from unpacking the knapsack and people like Kimberly Crenshaw, so it trickles down from academia. Um, if you look in the universities, black studies, Jewish studies, women's studies, these are all things where you look at the group and you look at what they've done that are achievements and you lift them up um, as, a, as a point of pride. But we've recently seen in Edinburgh, they hosted an event called Resisting Whiteness, which is exactly the opposite. That uh, anything to do with white culture is being deconstructed and ripped apart. Um, another example is in Australia, uh, there was a university that wanted to uh, do a course on Western civilization, and that got shut down because that was seen as colonialist, imperialist, white supremacist, when it's not white supremacy. White supremacy is bloody Ku Klux Klan dudes and stuff, which we all disavow. Um, but the term's been redefined as I see it. Um, yeah, I, 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 th I don't think I have a question attached to that, but I, I see, a, I, uh, I see to, a deep, deep attack on, on whiteness from the universities. And I think we're years too late to this debate, to be honest. You don't have to um, smuggle your point in the form of a question. Um, thank you. I just want to say I agree that white, white supremacy exists, but I don't think for, like, for any second that we should use it as an excuse to not go out and get opportunities. Mm -hmm. As a black person myself, I'm not gonna use that excuse to say, oh, I can't get into Oxford because I'm black and they're not gonna take me. We should never ever let that be an excuse for us because we can go there, get these opportunities. And at the same time, 
um, it's always going to exist, but there's systematic racism as well, from the very top to the very bottom. So it's always going to be there. It's going to be a struggle that we're going to always have to face, but <coughs> just get through it. Yeah. My question is specifically for Ahmed. You said that you don't need to have white skin to have white privilege. Does that not imply that white is privilege is the wrong word? And that maybe we should call it establishment privilege or perhaps just privileged privilege? I think I have a question. <laughs> in the end, I have a question. That's fine. But I have a horrible habit every once in a while of arguing with people on the internet, and I need to stop doing it. <laughs> but it was a discussion, oddly, on a travel forum. Um, and uh, it started with um, a young girl who had gone to Ottawa, uh, Montreal, Canada, and she was Chinese, and she went to buy food, and somebody greeted her with konnichiwa. And so she said, I think it was horribly racist. I did not feel safe. I'm never going back to Montreal. So, of course, people had questions. The moderator was a black woman. And so it got really uncomfortable really quickly because anyone said, I don't understand why you felt unsafe. Were you physically intimidated? No. And white people don't get to tell us when we feel unsafe. So people had questions. And as it was going through, the moderator was muting all the white voices and saying, nope, you're muted. This is not a discussion for you. So I watched this unfold and I said, well, okay, but wouldn't it be helpful for the white people in this group to understand the perspective of, of minorities? You know, wouldn't that be useful? To which she, she responded, it is not the responsibility of people of color to educate white people on our experience. Then I had more questions, but I got muted. <laughs> so my, th there was some tension in this for me because, um, A, if you don't educate white people who have the privilege, then they might not care. But here's where my question comes in, and this is the tension. Is I couldn't say that because I was, I was muted anyway, but I wouldn't have said that, well, we could use our privilege to help you if we knew what the problem was, because my fear was that they were going to say, we don't need your white savior complex to help us. And I guess, you know, this happened a year and a half ago, and I'm still considering this perspective. Is it worse to say, hey, I'm, I'm a middle class white woman in academia, maybe I could help you, or is that worse? I, I'm stuck with this tension, and I'd love your perspective. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to go back to the panel now, but we will come back out to the, to the audience. We'll, we'll come back out. Um, so lots, um, lots of things to throw out there. I've heard, heard a lot of um, phrases being thrown around. Um, uh, white saviour, white culture. That's a funny one. Um, is, is there something to that? Whiteness. Um, you know, maybe we can unpack um, what some of these things mean. Uh, okay, let's go to you first. Um, yeah, I, I think, I, well, I agree with you, don't I? Obviously, because I was talking, I was saying it, you know, basically that there is, it's, it, it's a bit to answer what you said and also to pick up on what Miriam said earlier on, which is, you know, we are talking here about white privilege, but actually I personally think that when we talk about privilege, it, it goes beyond that. And actually you can think of yourself as being white and even within different ethnic minorities, with different ethnic groups, wherever you may be around the world, there is different hierarchies as well. But with regards to this particular aspect of white privilege, I think it's a mindset privilege, yeah? And it can really, really exist. But I think the reason why I agree and I disagree is because, of course I agree, right? I'm from a working class, back, a migrant background, working class background, I've written on this, I've done all sorts of work on this, I've, had, I've, I've created bursaries for people from various different ethnic, uh, different cultural and socio-economic backgrounds in the media industry, et cetera, simply to readdress some of those things because of the d difficulty in terms of access to get the kind of roles that eventually may help you cr create the kind of output that might change the world around you, right? So I understand all of that. But when it comes to the, the specific thing about white privilege, it's actually that thing which goes beyond having, uh, having the ability to choose or to, to do what you want to do, you know, the, the, that, that aspect of privilege. It's that unknown privilege that you have. That's what we're talking about here, which is you, you can be... I am going to tell you what, the way I really felt it, I thought racism and all those kind of things was going in the early to mid-90s. And I remember at one, I think in the late 90s, I decided, 
uh, well, I wanted to buy a house and have a family and all those kind of things. So I went back to the north of England, um, got a job, and I was an executive producer. I was, I, if any of you are old enough to remember shows like Every Man, I was the editor of Every Man and all those kind of things. I was a player, right? <laughs> I would go to the Sainsbury's where I lived, and the white girl on the checkout would look at me like there was something on the bottom of my shoe. <laughs> or I'd go and pull the petrol where I lived, and you could feel it. And I could see it all around it and the kind of conversations that people had. And I actually hadn't realised it because I'd lived in London for so many years. And when I went back to the little suburb, in the, in, 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 well, I went, to, I went back to Bolton, I felt it. And you felt the kind of like the, the isolation and all those kind of things. And the privilege that somebody felt that they would have. My education, my background, all that meant nothing because when they saw me, they just saw the fact that I was below them. And actually, it's very hard to articulate that because you might not really get it. And I'm not one of those, I'm actually not a victim. I'm not one of those people, right? I'm not somebody who goes on about this all the time, but I'm telling you, it's real. I feel it all the time. I feel it from the middle class type people who look down on me because I didn't go to the, I didn't have, I mean, I, without going to give away too much, in the last couple of months, I have been approached by headhunters about becoming a, a master at, Oxford, this is this bangles this one lady from the <laughs> last week. I've been a master at Oxford Colleges, and do you know what I say to them? The first thing I have to say, and listen, I'm not making this up, last two months, two approaches from headhunters. Uh, it goes nowhere once I say this, which is, um, you know, I didn't go to Oxford. And they go, yeah, yeah, I say, and I didn't go to Cambridge either. And their presumption is that I could not have done the job that I, uh, the jobs that I've had, particularly the last one, uh, and the ASA and, the, and Ofcom and all those people wouldn't have me as a non exec director. <laughs> if I hadn't been to somewhere like Oxford or Cambridge. And then that's when, that's when the headhunter's approach kind of like politely goes away. <laughs> because it's their presumption, that's, that of, of privilege, that I must have been to a place like that to have done that kind of job. Because you couldn't have gone to a high school in Bolton and then gone to art school and all those kind of things and have done that kind of role. That's, that, that's what privilege is. Uh, Courtney. Um, yeah, I think I'd like to go back to uh, the question that was put down here, uh, uh, as well as the, the lady at the top there. Because as I think it, in many ways, if we try to kind of evaluate how things have um, panned out in the last, um, especially sort of 30, uh, 40, 50 years, uh, I don't think the, the young lady 50 years ago would have probably thought about going to um, somewhere like Oxford or Cambridge. Whereas today now, um, you know, it, it's quite common uh, for, for young uh, black and ethnic mi minorities to think about, you know, sort of going uh, to, you know, Russell uh, academies. Uh, and I think that in many ways that's uh, it's kind of proof for me of how things um, legally, um, in terms of employment laws, in terms of kind of structural arrangements in, uh, in British society, how things are, uh, have improved or at least um, you know, historically, are moving in the right direction. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, for me, um, what's important now, um, you know, because ever since we've had the Equality, uh, was it 2011, um, uh, the Equality Act, um, you know, a British society uh, uh, has changed, um, you know, fundamentally uh, in many ways. There's a lot more opportunities uh, now uh, for, for black people, uh, uh, for black and ethnic minorities. Um, uh, and I think, you know, uh, to, to a certain degree, yes, we do, you know, still have problems, uh, uh, as was mentioned here before, in terms of, you know, sort of uh, immigration and uh, uh, migration uh, into this country, uh, especially from uh, non-white uh, um, uh, countries and society. Uh, we still do uh, have a lot of problems and a lot of things to resolve. But in terms of kind of employment and in education and in terms of just generally opportunities that there are out there, I think British society has come you know, a very long way to the extent that I would you know, almost argue that today Britain is not really actually a racist society. You know, I would say... You know, I'd argue it's kind of you know, across the board uh, from uh, 
companies in the FTSE that have diversity policies uh, and equality policies, uh, right through to, to government, that actually it's quite reasonable to actually argue these days that uh, you know we're actually living these days uh, sort of morally, politically, politically and uh, legally in an anti-racist society uh, these days. Uh, you know, that's, that's what I would like to, uh, I think we can actually start arguing that sort of point of view. That's great. Um, Catherine. Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, it's all really interesting, all these points. Uh, the business of, I, I hear it from Courtney and I hear it from the very enthusiastic uh, audience member in the front here uh, about uh, not being br able to break out of the color of our skin um, and that we're individuals and that in 2019 it should be the case that uh, we can be individuals. I mean, I would say, yeah, uh, perhaps it should be, but but it, it might not be. Um, and um, and the reason why uh, we're not talking about the law to the question over here is because when people talk about white privilege nowadays, they're not talking about the law. They're talking about as Akil was saying, a, a general feeling that you get when you're in certain situations, things that are said to you, are you treated differently? In fact, I would argue that um, it's because all of those equality laws and so on have been put in place over the last 60, 70 years that things have changed substantially. And that, of course, as I said, talking earlier, you, you would, 50 years ago, you would have chosen to be the white guy, whatever, whether you were ugly or short or whatever it was. Um, but nowadays, it's much more complex. And if I want to come back as a white guy, I want to be a certain type of white guy. And um, uh, the thing is, I mean, I have a lot of uh, sympathy for what Miriam has said. I mean, I, you know, ostensibly, we are on opposite sides of the debate, and we are. But uh, what, what I like when I hear her speak is her saying, well, I want to listen to people. And what she's saying is, look, if there's all these black people who are telling you the country is racist in X, Y, Z way, then why aren't you listening to them? Um, and Akil is then going, listen, this, these were my experiences. Please listen to me. Please listen to me. Now, the problem, I think, with Miriam is that she goes too far. So it, when she's saying that, and, and I, I, I really value and, and, and you know, admire her ability to kind of say, well, look, all these people are saying it, so it must be true. The problem with that is that it then allows black people to be able to claim anything. You know, you're wearing a pair of trainers, so you must be racist against me. You know, it, 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 what, what might they say? And the, 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 what it doesn't acknowledge is that all human beings have a desire to play the victim. All, it is human nature to uh, want to explain your own failures by pointing outwards as opposed to pointing inwards. It's just human nature for everybody, whatever color you are. So it wasn't my fault, it's my teacher hates me. It wasn't my fault, but my mom wouldn't let me do my homework or whatever it is, right? You're always blaming other people. And so because of that, one needs to question what the, the, the claim that things are as racist as they are. Um, now, the problem, this lady in the middle here is saying, well, what can I do as a white person? You know, it reminds me of that in the Spike Lee Malcolm X uh, movie where uh, a white person goes up to Malcolm X and says, what can I do as a white person to help? And he says, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and it's really sad because your experience is just horrifying um, when black people are turning around and saying, what was it you said? Um, you know, uh, oh, it's not my job to educate white people. And I kind of get why they're saying that because they're saying, look, I'm sick and tired of being a black person having to march around and tell white people X, Y, and Z, why is it my job? I'm not a social worker. They should just get a life. <laughs> but on the other hand, <laughs> on the other hand, if white people don't have these conversations with black people, then how on earth are they meant to know any of this stuff? So that's where I have huge respect for Miriam, because actually it's amazing to hear a white person speaking as she's speaking. Having said that, you can't just go so far. So th th there's an in-between here. I mean, it's really interesting what the uh, young woman was saying up at the top there about getting into Oxford. You know, the fact is that um, uh, my kids at school, for instance, uh, the ones who have joined us in the sixth form, uh, black kids, they believe that they cannot get into Oxford. And they believe that because David Lammy continuously tells them that they cannot, okay? And so because he keeps saying that, they think they can't. They then, the, 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 so there's this situation of white privilege, right? It, they, white kids are privileged because they don't hear all the time about how they're not going to get into Oxford. <laughs> David Lammy, a black man, is the one who is telling my black kids that they can't get into Oxford. Now, luckily, they've got me as a headmistress, so I can say to them, don't listen to David Lammy, he's an idiot. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I can help them. 
that actually if I were a white headmistress and I felt uncomfortable and guilty about the fact that I'm white, then I might not be able to handle that situation. So as this woman was saying here, unfortunately, the situation, as I was talking about earlier, uh, of white privilege is exacerbated by the, the race lobby who are marching around all the time saying racism, 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 and it's not helpful. It may very well be the case that there was white privilege in various ways. And so I'm not trying to, when I'm not discounting white privilege, as Miriam was saying, when I'm talking about tall privilege and pretty privilege and so on, I'm putting it into a context. I'm saying that everybody is an individual and that everybody has different privileges. <laughs> And that that all weighs up in the end. So I am better off than the kid in Hull who does, who has a mom who can't read and is going to some terrible school. Having said that, I will face racism. Uh, it, it, it's complex. So, and all of this business—I mean, the resisting whiteness stuff and the being anti-Western culture—that is because the debate has gone far too far to the other side. Um, you know, uh, your points about white supremacy are absolutely spot on. This poor man in, in, who runs these charter schools in Brooklyn, who has been fired, he has lost his job because he questioned that he, he said, to, "Well, objectivity isn't about white supremacy." I mean, how can conversations about objectivity? be a white supremacist conversation. It's not. What he was saying was right, and yet he's lost his job. That's how bad things have got. So we, we have to be really careful. One more point I'll just make about what Miriam was saying, which is that... Can, can you make it in the next bit? OK. All right. <laughs> on, on. Let's hear from Miriam now. <laughs> So first off, I probably have to point out that I come from a political science background. Um, and so obviously the categories that I use um, for analysis are, are, are constructed categories of analysis. And just to be clear, um, class, gender, and race are all constructed categories, just for the record here. So unless you object to the use of any constructed category for analysis, you probably shouldn't object to the use of race as a constructed category for analysis. Now, um, I need to point out that I'm not just going off hearsay in the work that I do. I'm going off for pretty established um, statistics in, in pretty much every sphere of British life. And to point out, um, to pick up on something Catherine said, as a, as a, any of you know the comedian Chris Rock, he was on stage a few years ago. I think it was at the Apollo in America. Um, and he stood up on stage and he said, you know what? I'm a millionaire. I'm a black millionaire at a sold out show in America. Now, how many of you white people in the audience want to trade places with me? How many do you think wanted to trade places with a millionaire, super successful black comedian? None. And that's because they're aware, as we're aware, that being black in America, at least, and to a large extent here as well, carries with it a set of structural disadvantages which speak in no way to the essential value of people who are identified as that category. To recognize that there are structural differences in the outcomes, the life outcomes of people on the basis of their ethnic backgrounds in, is in no way to make the supremacist statement that those differences are grounded in anything true. Those differences are the product of a history, and a history which, to a large extent, has been whitewashed. There are large aspects of British history that I would suspect uh, particularly white people are not aware of. Now, um, the gentleman here referred to uh, white culture and his rejection of the term white supremacy. Yeah, European culture. I, Okay. No, you did actually use the term white yeah, yeah. culture. So just, just to be clear, I would say that the, white, the term white culture is a supremacist term, and that actually it would be your buddies at the KKK who would use the term white culture. Um, and, so, and so in that sense, um, I think it's probably a good idea to question, firstly, as I tried to allude to, where the category white came from. And as I repeat, it came from a political context in which it serves the objective to divide the working class and to create a category of powerful versus a category of powerless, structurally speaking, not in essentialist terms, I repeat. And in order to justify that, obviously, European culture built a whole history. I don't know how many of you saw Angela, Angela Saini's recent 
documentary on eugenics, the body of eugenics, which came out of UCL, which is the history of race science that came out of this country, universities here in the UK, which then exported the race science to justify the enslavement and the oppression and exploitation of people all around the world. I think if you want to talk about European culture, it is impossible to dis disentangle it from a history of white supremacy. Now, to come to your point over here about whether you as a white person carry this white burden, listen, this isn't about you in that sense. And I think it's really like worrying that we bec like it's, it's a there's a term for it. It's called white fragility. When white people are made to understand <laughs> Sorry, as, speak, a as a category of no, power. No, we'll come to yes. you later. Sorry, she's speaking. No, we're listening. Excuse me, we're listening to Miriam now. Thank you very much. Mm. The term white fragility refers to the reaction that white people have when identified as white, meaning <coughs> when you're made accountable for the meaning that the racial identity that you are a part of means. That doesn't mean it's you, it doesn't mean you're a bad person, you might be the loveliest person in the world, but you belong to a category of power that has a history and it has meaning and it has implications in the present and your lack of awareness of it, not you specifically, sir, you might be very aware of it, but our lack of awareness of it plays into enduring inequalities in this context and is also, to, in my view, quite insulting to people of color's histories, which are part of British history. They are part of European history. When we talk about, and this, this is one point I really would love to be able to make, if I may, when we talk about uh, British history, we are basically at the moment talking about a truncated version of history. We're talking about a version of history which is essentially in many ways served to justify the in territorial and political encroachment into other people's lands and the exploitation of their people. Let's talk just about the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833, which we love to talk about, Britain's grand, grandiose moment. We, free, we Britain, freed 800,000 Africans. Well done, pat on the back. We are the great savior nation. Those 800,000 Africans, by the way, who were just 800,000, we were involved just during one period in history in um, transporting over 3 million Africans as part of the transatlantic slave trade, but we'll park that for a second. Mm -hmm. Those 800,000 Africans that were freed as part of the Abolition Act did not receive a single penny of compensation. You were exploited your entire life, your family was, your ancestors were, you don't get a penny. You know who did get compensation for that? The slave owners did. It was the biggest bailout in British history until the banks in 2015. That loan that was taken out to pay back the slave owners <coughs> took up until 2015 to be paid back. That means you taxpayer, you taxpayer were paying back the families of people who were being reimbursed for the loss of their property. This is our history. This is a history that you are not aware of and it is part of our history and our blindness to that history feeds into our inability to recognize the ways in which it continues to fuel inequality today. Now you can say that's racist, I understand you feel like a victim, but the facts speak differently. You are not the victim. You are not the victim here. Thank you. <laughs> I saw this woman on the end had her hand up. First of all, I'm not black, but I've, I've been the, the target, if you like, of the same kind of thing about being um, somehow white, fragile, or whatever. But I think most of the dialogue today has more or less identified that the term white privilege, white fidelity, um, are very blunt instruments because there are so many more um, intersections that you can go into. Um, my question very specifically is, I, I accept, I'm just going back to the person who said, I can't remember who it was, that um, Britain today is really not fundamentally a racist place anymore. Um, two comments. Um, a lot of the American experience, American studies are always being imported as if we were exactly the same. 
you can't deny that there were things that are still wrong here with the wind rush scandal and all the rest of it uh, and, and, and all that. But they are in the past, and today we are not the same as America. Um, I would like to point out, as David Olasoga did, that a lot of slave, uh, some slave owners were black who were compensated. Um, and also, there was a study of um, a French colony where the kind of process you were discussing, and I don't know whether you know, it, it's the same one you're thinking of, but essentially the separation of the white working class and the colored working class was actually supported by um, black slave owners um, in this French colony. So I'm not talking about British, I'm talking, I'm talking about white, it's, it's a European thing. But they are all European things in the past. Um, to actually make current people who are mostly not racist in this country feel like they are responsible for the things that happened hundreds of years ago that they had absolutely no um, is, is not only unhelpful because it creates factions where they shouldn't be. But my question now is to what extent is the strength of your arguments, I'm talking Miriam here, your arguments and others who espouse it, um, um, further strengthened by hate crimes that are in fact over and above what criminal action should be, things like oh, that was um, incitement to racism or incitement to this and that. Because going back to your question, um, you're white, so nobody ever asks your opinion, and that's privilege. But actually, if you ask somebody who is in the North, say, feeling very much economic pressure what they think, and if they dared to say something like, oh, the community isn't the same as it was because there are other people of other cultures, they would immediately be labeled as racist. So how do you get around that from a structural point of view, possibly from a policy-making point of view, possibly from an academic point of view, because it is a problem. Hi, um, uh, white, straight, able male here, so kind of <laughs> Miriam's, <laughs> Miriam's top number one enemy in the hierarchy of oppression, no doubt. Um, I'd just like to- Why is it enemy? Uh, can you not interrupt, please? Enemy? I'm speaking. <laughs> so, there's, not um, the first time I've heard that from one of okay. your kind. <laughs> All right, let's um, let's get back think... to the discussion. Let's, let's... You want to take it there, my friend? I, th I can play ball. Let's do. I think I think that tells it all, says it all, doesn't it? From your kind. Make your point, please. Make okay. Your point. Well, that is part of my point. Uh, this is part of my point. Is is um, and it has been echoed already about this this kind of simple notion of of, of, of white privilege and white supremacy. So in answer, the problem lies in with the question, is, does, does white privilege exist? It's a too simplistic question. Of course it exists. Of course, there are times when people gain privilege because of their skin color, undoubtedly. But is it, sorry, is it Catherine? Catherine, yeah. yeah. As Catherine correctly pointed out, there's almost unlimited you know, array of different forms of privilege that, that people can benefit from. So economic class seems to be, for me, the central driver and the real problem we have here, the real racism, the real white privilege, comes from the likes of Miriam. That's where the real, that's where the challenge needs to be. And it's telling because she at one point said, if you challenge a person of colour, then automatically then you're part of the problem. That's white privilege. It's this notion that, that, that people of colour, black people, whoever, whatever skin colour you come from, are somehow weaker, lesser beings without any autonomy. Um, that somehow they should be um, protected and, and kept in, in a, wrapped in cotton wool and have their beliefs protected. Well, I'm sorry, it is not the case. It's a loose term used to describe millions of individual, complex human beings who have individual rights. Of course. They are not part of it. They are not an homogenous collective blob that you can ascribe and put your privilege and your prejudice and your clear white guilt ironically, um, onto them. And, and I would just like to ask you, 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 you right, again, right, you, right. you talked about structural racism and, 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 and things like that. The only example you can cite are historical ones like this lady pointed out. Can you please tell me how the Arab slave trade, for example, that predated the European slave trade by centuries and lasted for eight, 800, 900 years and arguably is still going on. Does that give people Arab privilege? Can you please address that, thank you. So you pass the mic there, this lady. No, no, no we can hear from her first. Um, we haven't got that long left, so keep your points relatively short, and panelists are not likely to be able to answer your questions, so I'd just make points. 
Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been taking part in I've been taking part in discussions oh, about race and racism for I don't know 25 years, and it's got more and more toxic in yeah. very very recently. Now, why the hell would that be? Uh, well, you can gesture, um, but I would suggest it's actually white privilege as an approach, and I think that is it's, it's so evidently divisive. I mean, you can just see it in the audience. I mean, I've never been in a discussion like this about race, I've, and it's it's got far worse, and we're moving further and further away from being able to actually understand what the hell is going on because it's extremely <laughs> difficult to know. It's quite possible that both sides are right, if there are indeed sides, in that black people are experiencing racism on a daily basis in all different kinds of ways. They go to a petrol station and you know, they have to um, prepay, which I've witnessed in a petrol station. A black man had to prepay, and I couldn't figure out what the hell was going on, and he sort of smiled at me and raised his eyebrows, and I realised what it was. That's, that's just everyday crap racism. No, okay, fine. No, okay. Okay, no, I know. Speak. No, but listen, no, no, wait, wait, shush. You're not the only person. But it's also <laughs> equally possibly true that white people in a workplace, a white man or a white woman, is very aware of diversity training, of people going in to educate them, assuming that they are racist, and that both of those sides of the coin are true. So how the hell do you try to move forward from that incredibly divisive uh, culture that's been created? And I would say it's been absolutely created uh, in the recent period by really toxic terms like white privilege, which is just a kind of blanket moral position to elevate you, I have to say, mm -hmm. into a very comfortable position and to kind of win authority in a way that actually cheats because it doesn't actually allow you to understand the present moment. That's why you have to leap back 200 years or 60 years and cherry pick the past. And that's really different to trying to understand the very different layers at which people are currently experiencing particular problems today. Okay, pass the mic forward there to the lady. <laughs> lady there, yes. Okay. I'd just like to yeah. kind of say I would be interested to see if we brought Meghan Markle or Raheem Sterling to this room, what they would think after, or Tyrone Mings, after walking off the pitch against Bulgaria, monkey chance against him, what happens to Bulgaria? They get a smaller fine than Nicholas Bentner who showed Paddy Power across his pants. What's that trying to say <laughs> about the generation? You say the UK is not racist. You ask that to Raheem Sterling when Chelsea fans are saying monkey chants to him, you tell me that's not racist. Okay, maybe we're not as bad as America or something else, but maybe we need to take a look in the mirror at people like that who are saying, you know, oh, look at me, the priv oh, look at me, I'm, I'm Mr. I'm Mr. Interrupting each other, please. I'm Mr. Getting attacked here, you know. Oh, that didn't happen to me, so therefore it can't have happened, you know. We need to start looking at ourselves, you know. I look at people that are my friends who are black and they're getting racially abused at school. What's going to happen? Oh, no, it can't have been. It can't have been. By white people, that's who, sir. Please white speak, people please, who think that they're ahead of black people because of their race. And we say, OK, maybe there's less people before, then that makes it OK. Stormzy tries to give opportunities to black people, and he gets shut down because, oh, no, that's anti-white. No, it's not anti-white, my friend. It's pro-black, yeah. and there's a difference. <laughs> um, I just want to say that white privilege does not equate to white hate. We're not saying that just because you're privileged that we hate you. That's not the argument. Furthermore, the question itself, is white privilege real? You're, as Miriam said at the beginning, the flip side to that is discrimination that suffered from BAME groups. So you, you're literally turning around the argument to victimize white people once again, tr trying to silence people of color and making yourself the victim when it ain't about you. <laughs> I just want to say before, um, thank you again, um, and I just want to make it clear, this is all from personal experience. I don't know about the statistics and whose employment and everything like that. This is just personal. Um, what I'm at, like, it's like a little story and then a little question. Uh, Can you keep I don't it short? Yeah, yeah, it's very short. I don't expect a medal or a pat on the back or anything, but in primary school, when I was uh, in year three, um, we were just playing a little football with the kids, and uh, the majority of the kids there are like from minority groups, um, but you know, just happened to be just playing with the um, people, like white people. And I saw in the corner uh, a little black kid getting beaten up. I don't know him, anything like that. Um, but then when I went to see what's going on, they, the, the kid's response was, he doesn't look like us, so um, we're just beating him up. And I don't know the kid, but in return, I picked up a chair and hit all those kids. Okay. 
Okay. And and then afterwards, that kid, you know, food, like, became my best friend, and I still took him to the whatnot that that we moved. But um, what in result of that happened was when the parents got called in, um, the kids got away with it. They said they were defending themselves against the black kid, and apparently I instigated it, went aggressive, and I beat the kids up, and we got excluded for a week. Bear in mind, this is, this is in year three. This ain't even secondary school or anything. And coincidentally, maybe it's just in the family fate, the exact same thing happened, okay, like the, the story to my brother last week, but it wasn't as bad as it happened to me. So the, because maybe um, times are changing, maybe the white privilege that current older generations are seeing is not as bad as ours because we're more diverse in our generation, et cetera, whatnot, because our parents are maybe immigrants or maybe first generation, whatnot. I'm not going to go into that. So my kind of question is, do you think education is uh, not something that instigated but can improve white privilege in the future? We're going to go back to the panel now. Really, really short, um, final, you know, kind of summing up, and we're going to go in the opposite order to where we started. So, Courtney. One of the most important questions that was put forward here tonight came from the lady uh, uh, over here, and it's about really the rise of identity politics and the toxic kind of uh, um, influence is having on, a, on the question and the debates on race, because we can't even begin, because me personally, I, I don't even believe in the concept of race. I know it's not very uh, uh, kind of a politically correct thing to say these days, but you know, um, uh, we can't even begin to even uh, dis uh, move forward to those kind of discussions because we're, you know, we're, uh, we're stuck, we seem to be stuck um, in, in this debate of, about um, kind of identity and, and the nature of identity. I just think, you know, um, uh, she, uh, she was correct. Uh, things are far, far more complex um, uh, than um, uh, the current debates um, about uh, surrounding <laughs> identity and, and race are, are currently uh, kind of enlightening um, at the moment. But I think... Um, Ultimately, um, uh, I think we need to take a far more critical look at the way um, identity politics is kind of uh, shaping uh, the way uh, people are starting to think these days. And um, I think we just need to be um, far more uh, critical because it is really having uh, a divisive um, influence and um, a divisive and censorious influence. Uh, on the current debates uh, around racism. So um, if anything, uh, we need to go um, from here uh, and think much more critically uh, about the way that identity politics is, uh, you know, sort of uh, 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 just actually making things uh, much more worse than, um, uh, than making things better for us. Thanks, uh, Miriam. Thanks. Um, so just to come back to this lady here to start off with, um, so obviously you will be aware, I'm sure, that some of the colonies only received independence from the 1960s. So that is in some people's lifetimes, and we're not therefore talking about ancient history. We're talking about some people that you might even know today who would still remember a period under colonial rule. So I'm talking to this lady up here about your point. Um, then just to come back about my statistics, I think I did open with a load of contemporary statistics, but if you um, are unclear about the state of racial inequality in this country, there are many online bodies that you can refer to for the ways in which that is uh, pretty evident. Running Mead would be my uh, top recommendation on that one. To come back to the gentleman here, firstly, I'd like to apologize for my childish behavior. It, it's, uh, it was unfortunate and I apologize for that. Um, I think you're right, there is a toxic dimension to some of these conversations and that isn't helpful within that. What I would like to say is that you're right to point out that there is a resentment and I think that's what you were touching on among working class white communities in this country. However, what I would also like to draw your attention to is that even when those from working class backgrounds are successful in entering the country's elite occupations, which clearly is still a massive issue, class is a massive issue and a barrier today, they go on to earn, on average, £6,400 less than their colleague whose parents were middle class, professional or managerial jobs. So that's a nearly 16% class pay gap for someone like yourself, sir. And I understand that that would be a cause of resentment. 
However, I'd like to point out that that is exacerbated for women, people with disabilities and most ethnic minorities. Each face a distinct double disadvantage. Women from working class backgrounds earn on average 19,000 less a year in elite occupations than privileged men. And the figure is even higher for non-white women. So just to be clear, there are, as we talked about, I think several layers to which um, privilege operates. Finally, just on, to come back to your lady, I know it wasn't in this round, Education is absolutely key. We don't tell the right stories about what it means to be British today. There are people in, in classrooms today whose stories of what it means to be British are not told. They're having to learn it during one month for, in Black History Month when a couple of volunteers come in and dedicate that time. That's not right. It's not right. And it doesn't tell all the other missing histories of who we are as a nation. You're absolutely right, and it touches on what this lady says here. I think a lot, yeah, a lot of white people uh, in these conversations, can I just point out, I also don't believe in race. Race is a constructed category. I repeat myself, but I need to say it again. I'm a Muslim. I believe in souls, but you, we, we exist as souls in bodies, which exist in societies, which exist within larger constructs. All of those have implications for how we live, and we can't ignore them. It's not easy entering these conversations from a position of privilege. It might seem easy because it's from a position of privilege, but I appreciate that it isn't. All I would say is that, you know, we have a lot to unlearn and it maybe is time to maybe develop a slightly thicker skin in those conversations. And, and, I, and I can only say I know that it's not always easy. But it is a labor to ask people to educate you about things. And my the best thing that I can say is that ideally try and do as much of the homework on your own and then form meaningful relationships with people that are not of the same background as you when you want to ask questions rather than just calling on them when you need something from them which you know could be a paid service in some industries yeah no what, what Miriam just said though that's the story of my life you know and actually people pay me for it as well but, but actually but the vast majority of people don't pay me for it they just ask yeah. advice because they, you could argue, are they too lazy to find out themselves or is it too difficult to find out? Or, you know, are they just finding out when it, when it suits them? Um, and, uh, and the fact is, you know what, if we don't understand each other, then we'll never know anything. And actually, that brings me back to this one. Actually, I think that, to me, always, I've always felt something like using, the, using a big term like white privilege is, is too blunt an instrument. That's why I think quite a few of us, and myself included, have talked about all the different kind of characteristics, all the different kind of things that can come up. You know, you can be uh, where I grew up, and all my friends were white where I grew up in the north, West, in, in the north of England. You know, my, my friends went on to be, you know, kitchen fitters and, and but did the YTS. You know, I went to art school. That got me out of it. So I understand. I know where I'm coming from. I know exactly what it, what, what, who gets listened to and who doesn't get listened to. So when we talk, uh, you know, we've talked about the whole thing about white privilege. Yes, the phrase is a, is a silly phrase, right? But the fact of the matter is something does exist. It really does exist. Because those guys, when I, when I bump into them at a football game still, they still think they're bloody better than me, right? Mm -hmm. I can see it. And they say it. And they ask it. And I feel it. But that doesn't mean that we're not <laughs> friends. But they just have that, there's something inside them that makes them feel that they're, they're superior, superior. And it might go back to something from when their childhood or whatever, but they just have it, yeah? And that's the thing about this is actually we can have as many statistics as we like, but it's very difficult to quantify, but actually history has shown us this because of all the things that Miriam said, all the things everybody has said, which is something does exist. But I agree, as a blunt, the, the term is a blunt instrument, but, the, it, but debating it is really important. Catherine. Yeah, um, the Raheem Sterling point um, and the business about asking, I mean, do black people experience racism every day? I'm not sure. I mean, that's the, ultimately what this all rests on. Uh, there are some people who are saying, yes, 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 it's really awful to be black and it's a constant thing, constant problem. Uh, and then there are others who might say, look, there are examples, I would say, there are examples of racism, but this isn't something that is oppressing you constantly. Um, I think the point about... Um, Black people being silenced, I think that's quite wrong. I think rather than that, it is white people who are being silenced. And that is why they are unable to talk about culture change and to legitimately question the, the change of culture, say, in their town and so on. It, and, and these are legitimate things that they should be able to talk about. But because they'll be called racist, they can't do so. Um, and, and the man was talking about being the top in the hierarchy of oppression. That, we all need to recognize that uh, in 2019, 
you are considered a better person the higher up the victim pole you go. And so there is every incentive to uh, grab every possible example of victimhood. I'm a woman, I'm gay, I'm black, whatever it is. And you're trying to say, look, 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 I'm at the top. And so the white straight guy, he, he can't win when it comes to these kinds of discussions. So I understand their resentment. I understand why they're angry and why, why they get upset because they're being told, look, your opinion doesn't matter. You're not allowed to question what black people say. If black people say that they uh, encounter racism in X, Y, Z, then you just have to accept it, which is what Miriam was saying earlier. Now, that doesn't mean that what the black people might be saying could be true. It could be. But it must be challenged, and there must be conversations around these things. And, and, and the white person's opinion on these things should not be held in lesser regard than the opinion of a black person. Because then we're just going, I mean, we're going, back, we're going backwards. It should be the case that all of our opinions are considered. Now, it's true that the black person will have experiences that the white person doesn't have. So it's incumbent on the white person in that conversation to think, OK, well, let me hear what you have to say and consider it, which, of course, is what Miriam was saying. I, my advice to white people is always, you need to think about the black person you're talking to. You know, so like when, when uh, friends of mine or whatever, I'm talking to them and I'll say, well, I think this was racist or I think that was racist, then they might go, oh, I don't think so. I always say, well, think who I am. Think, it's very rare for me to call out racism. Very rare, I don't do it. So if I'm doing it, doesn't that say something to you? Now, if on the other hand, you have a black friend who's constantly calling racism everywhere and is saying every day, I can't, I can't live because of these microaggressions, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> then maybe you don't listen to them so much. So, <laughs> and the other thing I would ne never got to say was regards to all the stats you know, that Miriam was, um, was quoting earlier. The problem with stats is, so there's so many black people doing this and there's this many white people, therefore it must be racism, mm -hmm. is that we must distinguish between causation and correlation. It is not the case that just because there are fewer black people in managerial posts, therefore we're all racist. There could be a whole host of reasons for that. Um, you, you, we cannot always jump, and sadly the media always does jump to explain it through racism. And there may be racism. We just don't know that to be the case, and too often we, we act as if we do know. Right, can we thank our panel?